When I say the term Red Rattler, for a generation of Sydney ciders, it will bring back positive memories of a time long gone where single deck trains ruled the rails throughout the city. Or it will bring back memories of cooking inside of a hot steel train car that's still in service well past its use by date. Regardless of what's applicable to you, the Red Rattlers form a core part of Sydney's transport history. I need to preface this video by defining what I mean by Red Rattlers. I'm using the term to refer to a group of similar rail cars that include the standard Tulloch and Sputnik suburban stock. Often, people will include the older Bradfield stock in this group, but they're different enough to warrant their own video, which you can find in the cards and in the description. To begin, as I said in my last video, early 20th century Sydney was growing fast, and the existing steam haul trains were quickly becoming inadequate. So, it was decided to electrify the network. Originally, the majority of the fleet was to be made up of Bradfield cars, but it was coming increasingly clear that as time went on, only having 426 Bradfield cars would be inadequate to meet the expected demand. The government estimated that city would need 1,100 cars by 1930 in order to meet demand. So it was decided to order 674 new suburban cars, divided into 449 motor cars and 225 trailer cars. After investigating developments in rail car design around the world, the government decided that these new cars should be of all steel construction. This provided a few main advantages when compared to previous wooden carriages. The first being that there was less of a fire risk, which is especially important for trains operating in long tunnels, like Sydney City Circle. Another advantage is greater resistance to telescoping in the event of a collision, which also helps with safety. The other main advantage is if the cars are properly taken care of, they require less maintenance, reducing operating costs and extending the life of the carriages. This was somewhat counterbalanced by the added weight of steel cars, but by the early 1920s, it was practical to build all steel cars with comparable weights to timber cars. So it was decided that all future cars should be made of steel. This left the railways with a problem. No steel cars had been produced in Australia thus far. So it was decided that the first 50 car bodies would be built in England by the Leeds Forge Company, with interior fittings and bogies being manufactured locally. These new standard cars differed slightly from the previous Bradfield cars. Apart from the construction, the most notable change was to the door layout, with two double doors at either end of the car, instead of the Bradfield's four doors per side, with double doors at the far ends of each carriage. The reason this change was made was to allow for more seating. The original reason the Bradfield's had four doors per side was to reduce boarding time, and this was based on cars used by the New York City subway. But with the Bradfields having all transverse seating, it didn't make enough of a difference. So the standards were changed to only two doors per side. Otherwise, the cars used the same seating layout with transverse reversible seating through the length of the car that was separated into compartments by internal partitions. Additionally, they were built to the exact same dimensions as the previous Bradfield cars. In 1925, the first 50 cars arrived in a knocked down condition, where 40 were then assembled by the Clyde Engineering Company, and 10 by the government at the Everly Carriage Workshops. As electric service was still yet to begin, they were all put into steam hauled service alongside the existing Bradfield cars. In 1926, locally produced carriages built by Clyde Engineering and Walsh Island Dockyard began to be delivered. Curiously, these early standards were all motor cars, with the first trailers only being delivered in 1927. This wasn't an issue, however, as Bradfield trailers made up the imbalance of the fleet. Additionally, several Bradfield and standard motor cars were delivered as non-control motor cars and trailers, designated with an N and a T respectively. But these were all converted back to normal motor cars between 1928 and 1929. In total, 352 standard motor cars were built. The full details of who built which cars and when they were delivered is provided in the description below. The lion's share of motor cars were built by Clyde Engineering who built 202 cars in five batches. The first two batches were delivered between 1926 and 1927 and consisted of 50 cars total. The next two batches were delivered between 1928 and 1929 and consisted of 140 cars. And the final Clyde cars were delivered in 1937 to supplement earlier motor cars while they underwent refurbishment. 
These 12 Clyde cars are also referred to as modified standard cars as they had slightly smaller windows than their predecessors and additional ventilators on the roof. The next largest manufacturer was Walsh Island Dockyard, which built 100 cars in two batches. The first batch of 50 were delivered between 1926 and 1927, and the second 50 were delivered in 1928. The smallest batch were the original 50 Leeds Forge motor cars delivered in 1925. Under the bonnet, the standards were nearly identical to the Bradfields. They used the same electrical equipment, which consisted of a double pan slider type diamond pantograph connected to electro-pneumatic stepped resistor control driving two 360 horsepower motors on one bogey, with the motor bogey located directly below the pantograph. The standards also had the driver in a small cabin on the left side of the car, similar to subway trains of New York. This allowed passengers to look at the front of the car, but meant that the guard had to use the passenger door. So the cars were later modified to include a guard compartment, which comprised the forward section of the car. Unfortunately, I'm not able to find a date for this modification in any of my sources. The motor cars were also complemented by 248 trailers, all built by the Walsh Island Dockyard. Unlike the Bradfields, the standard trailers were all new builds and used the same overall design as the motor cars, just without the electrical equipment. But curiously, did still include a small crew compartment for the guard. One additional point to mention is that the Bradfield and Standards both had first and second class arrangements, but these were abolished in 1940, and all future suburban cars only had one class. In March 1926, Bradfield and Standard cars began to take over steam hauled services on the Illawarra line between Central and Oatley. As new cars were converted and delivered, electric trains began to take over more services, while electrification was expanded. Electric service between Oatley and Sutherland began in August 1926, followed by Central to Bankstown in October 1926, and the first leg of the city circle between Central and St. James in December 1926. This video would be too long to cover Sydney's electrification in detail, so I'll save it for a future video. Suffice to say, the electric network grew massively during this period, with electrification spanning as far as Liverpool and Parramatta by 1929. During October 1929, the Great Depression started, which caused orders for new cars and the expansion of electrification to slow down. The only major expansion to the network was the opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge alongside Town Hall and Wynyard stations in 1932, which allowed through service to the North Shore Line which was electrified in 1927. By the mid-1930s, the most drastic effects of the Depression were waning, and Sydney continued to expand its network. In 1937, the aforementioned modified standards were ordered to allow older cars to be refurbished. Additionally, six trailer cars were converted to driving trailers in the same year. In 1939, electrification along the entire length of the East Hills Line was completed, and in the same year, the Cronulla Line opened. This expansion meant that Sydney's existing fleet was starting to feel the strain, as more lines and higher passenger loads required more trains. In 1939, the New South Wales Department of Railways placed an order for 27 new motor cars and 24 new trailer cars with Tulloch Limited at Rhodes. Because some time had passed since the standard stock was designed, the railway had more experience with designing trains for Sydney, so it was decided to modify the design of the new Tulloch stock. The first change is that the motor cars had crew compartments that stretched across the width of the car as standard, similar to the standard cars after being retrofitted. This also meant there was a crew cab door on both sides of the car, as opposed to just on the left hand side like on the previous stock. They also featured longitudinal seating at the ends of the cars, a feature that will become standard on every suburban train in Sydney going forward. The final notable change was the door layout. In my Bradfield video, I mentioned that were the only suburban trains in New South Wales to have four doors per side. This is kind of untrue. The Tullocks also had four doors per side, but I still count them as two doors per side. This is because they use the same door layout as the standards, just spaced further apart to increase the width of the vestibule. This was done to reduce the dwell time in stations. Other than what I mentioned here, the Tullock stock was nearly identical to the standard stock. Even the electrical systems were identical. As a result, they often operated together with the Bradfield and Standard stock. 
In 1940, 24 of the motor cars and all trailers were delivered. The final three motor cars were delayed until 1951 due to World War II and a global steel shortage following the war. In 1943, an additional 47 motor cars and 105 trailers to the same design were ordered. The motor cars were delivered between 1952 and 1956, while the trailers were delivered between 1950 and 1957. The continued post-war growth and extension of electrification to Penrith in 1955 led to even more cars being needed, with further modifications undertaken. An order of 40 motor cars and 40 trailers was given to Commonwealth Engineering and was placed in 1955. These cars used the same base design as the previous Tullock stock, although they were of spot welded construction instead of riveted, which gave the cars a cleaner external appearance. Additionally, the crew cab was enlarged, and the crew cab door was moved further back on both sides of the car. The biggest change was to the electrical components. The only externally noticeable change is the use of a single pan pantograph instead of the double pan like on previous trains. However, internally, the new cars would have two 200 horsepower motors on two powered bogies, as opposed to the previous cars, which only had one powered bogey with twin 360 horsepower motors. This was done at the cost of the new cars not being interoperable with the previous stock. Additionally, they were the first cars to be equipped with power operated doors, as opposed to the manually operated doors on previous cars. This greatly improved safety and became a standard feature on all trains going forward. In 1957, the first of these new trains were delivered. Because they were incompatible with other trains on the network, they were designated as S-sets. They were actually the first cars to use their designation to denote a train type, not the depot they're allocated to. For all future trains, this was the normal practice. In the same year they were introduced, the Soviets launched the first artificial Earth satellite named Sputnik 1. The combination of being designated as S-sets and the launch of the first satellite led to their nickname of Sputniks. By 1960, the entirety of the Sputnik fleet had been delivered. These were the final cars delivered to what we would call the Red Rattler design, with all future cars being double deck. By the end of production, a total of 466 motor cars alongside 417 trailers were built, giving a grand total of 883 Red Rattlers. Throughout their lives, all the Red Rattler designs underwent quite a few changes. In 1960, the Department of Railways issued a request for new trailers to replace the earlier wooden Bradfield trailers. Tullock responded with a proposal for a double-deck car, with the first being delivered in 1964. When delivered, these new cars replaced the Sputnik trailers, which then went on to have their power-operated door equipment removed, and their electrical components modified to be compatible with the previous Bradfield, Standard, and Tullock stock. Originally, the double deckers were only going to be placed in Sputnik sets due to their motor cars having more power, but it was found that the older motor cars could also handle double deck trailers. As a result, they fully replaced the Bradfield trailers by 1968. In the same year, the Tullock double deck power car prototypes were delivered and formed into an eight car set designated as S10. This was followed by newer cars built by Comenge designated S11 onwards. Because of this, in 1972, the Sputniks were redesignated as W sets to avoid confusion. Between 1968 and 1975, some standard and most Tullock cars were modified to use the same motor layout as the Sputniks, with twin 200 horsepower motors on two bogies, but with the addition of airbag suspension. These cars can be identified by their numbers, which were increased by 4,000 to be in the 7,000 range instead of 3,000. Additionally, most of the standard cars were converted to have longitudinal seating in the end compartments, like the later Tullock and Sputnik stock. Starting in the 70s, some cars had their windows replaced by aluminium sliding windows to alleviate rust problems. And beginning in the 80s, some cars had their interiors redone in two-tone green. Between 1991 and 1992, one standard and two Sputnik sets were repainted into the Zoo Train Livery in order to promote Taronga Zoo. During the 1970s, the Rattlers began to slowly disappear off the rails as newer double-deck stock began to be introduced. By the late 1980s, their death warrant was signed, with the new Tangara trains coming to remove the final Rattlers in service. By 1992, this process was complete, and the final mangled door-operated Rattler made its last run across the Harbour Bridge. The final train was led by C-3426, which was also the first car to make its way across the Harbour Bridge back in 1932. 
Sputnik cars were kept in service until 1993 due to their more modern design, but ultimately were still replaced by Tangaras. After retirement, most cars were scrapped, but quite a lot were sold off, commonly as sheds or holiday homes. As a result, a lot of Rattlers have been preserved, a lot of which I'm going to skip because this video is long enough already. The three major groups that hold preserved Rattlers are Historic Electric Traction, which owns set F1 and W3, both of which are operational. In total, they own six standard cars, two Tullocks, and three Sputniks. Sydney Electric Train Society currently owns two standards and four Tullocks, and the New South Wales Railway Museum at Thelmere currently has one standard car on display. Links to find out more can be found in the description below. To conclude, the Red Rattlers are an iconic train for Sydney. They served for 70 years and formed the basis for nearly all rolling stock that came after them. While they may have been quite unsafe in their final years and disliked by the general public, they still formed a core part of the history of Sydney's suburban network. The one thing I find fascinating about old trains like this is just how much changed during their time in service. The Sydney of 1926 was choked full of steam locomotives and trams, and to people then, they were a breath of fresh air and modernity. But by the 1990s, they were serving a city choked full of cars and were seen as obsolete as they worked alongside trains that looked like they belonged to the 21st century. They were well before my time, but I still think they were brilliant trains, and they deserve to be remembered as some of the most notable trains in Sydney's history.